Buffalo gals and tractor boys, plant your seed deep within the fertile crescent, teach your harvester all the combinations, and just like my pappy always told me, it's time to talk tall to me. <laughs> I had a, I had a joke lined up, so I wasn't even paying attention. Uh, oh no! I was gonna say it's it's pronounced fertile croissant. <laughs> Back, I am Omen Thomas Say, and I am Nick McGill. We are the salt of the earth, the feckless mo. And this is the crop that the government does not subsidize. Talk tall to me. A 16-hour workday in the heartland of Prague Rock, in which nutrient balance Nick and odor management Omen will systematically dig up and sort by size every single track that certified organic rock band Jethro Tull have ever cultivated. We will check the phosphorus index of flying colors. We will measure the minstrel in the gallery manure setback. And we will make sure that Broadsword is within baseline compliance. And if the good lord's willing and the rains come regular, we will harvest a bumper crop of that rarest plant, the Scottish soybean, the flax and flautist, the Fleet Street sugar beet, Ian Animal Unit Anderson. You know, when Tull went free range, I really noticed a change in their product. Their their meat was a lot, it's a lot gamier, but the flavor is really like, it's really different. It's more expensive, but it's better for you and, and better for the environment. And that's that's really the most important thing. Yeah. Finally, they let Don Perry out of that cramped little cage. <laughs> a three by three cage for Don Perry, for the drummer. Yeah, of course, obviously. <laughs> Don's big. Isn't he a big guy? He's a large gentleman, yeah. Yeah, he's a large man. So, Nick, here we are, ankle deep in one of my very favorite albums, not that that's relevant, Crest of a Knave. That's right. And we're talking about the pen primary song, the second song off the album. <laughs> primary is is Latin, and pen would be Greek, I believe. I like to mix it up a little bit. It's canto Secundus. The second. Yes, the Conto Secundus yeah. uh, track. Thank you. Yeah. That's exactly what I meant. That's what I'm here for. Yes, we are going to discuss Farm on the Freeway today. But before we do, I just have a little... I have this this theory. It's very difficult to prove. I there's First of all, there's no one place to find all of Tull's like, official music videos. I did a very, very exhaustive okay. search for just like a playlist on YouTube, and I can't find anything. Sure. This is inspired by Steel Monkey last week. I watched the Steel Monkey video probably two or three times after we recorded it. I don't think the guitarist or drummer are Martin or someone else. It does not look like Martin as a drummer, as the guitarist, rather. It's not Babyface Martin. Interesting. Who could it be? You passingly joked about central casting sending over a drummer. I wonder if it's just some rando. That's fascinating. How bizarre. And then it made me think, well, let's think about Sweet Dream. Oh, it's only Ian in Sweet Dream. Then I'm thinking of the only other the only other tall music videos that I know are from the ones that they dropped for Zealot Gene. Much more recently. Yeah, most of them were puppets, but there's one with Ian in it. And that's it. And no one else. Yeah. It's in the contract. Maybe. Maybe. Oh. Well, if anyone can prove Nick's theory wrong by sending us a link to a full band music video, not a filmed live performance. Correct. Yeah. But a music video, we would love to see it. Yeah. Absolutely. And not not something that some schmo just put like a slideshow of tall pictures over the top of the music. I want official, like, chrysalis endorsed. I am that schmo. Oh, no. I could be that schmo. You do that for your holiday slideshows. It's not family photos. It's just tall. That's right. Yeah. Now, before we get schmoed down yep. anymore, yeah. um, why don't we jump into our pickup truck and drive down the earscape of Farm on the Freeway? Let's pick our ears of corn and listen. Wow. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
Nick McGill. Goodness me, Omen Sade. That was Farm on the Freeway. You know, I thought that song was longer than it was. You're saying it ended before you expected it to? No, it's the same length that it's always been. But in my in my mind, I was like, oh, yeah, that's that's one of them 11 minute long songs. It's not. It's only six minutes uh, something. It's 615, 630. That's that's super funny, because if you asked me to name like all of the long songs off of this album, I would very incorrectly tell you she said she was a dancer as a long song. It's only like three and a half minutes. Is it really? Yeah. That seems like a long song to me as well. And then I would not tell you Farm on the Freeway. I forgot this was a longer song. It is shocking us <laughs> both. It's temporally unstable, I think. That's right. Speaking of unstable, what is your feeling about this song? Boy, what a change from the last one to this one. Mm-hmm. From Steel Monkey to this. It's It starts out slow and sultry. We really get into... This is kind of the first instance of that really like... We're going to be talking about sexy songs a, a lot over the next couple of months. But this is the first of that sexy sound to the songs. We get a lot of sexy sounding songs too, I think. What is the sexosity of it for you? What what is the what are the sounds that are causing that reaction in, in your brain? I think it's that it's it's slow and it reaches the root chakra. <laughs> I don't know, there's something about it's not just that like the tempo is slow, but there's kind of an underlying energy to it. There's a depth to it. Yeah. There's a rumbly low quality to it yeah there's also a lot of very mm, pent up and then released yes energy yes 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 there's a lot of climbing that hill climax and dropping but then there's more it's not just one there's always there's always more there's always more where that came from play your cards right i a lot of that is coming from the guitar this Mm -hmm. this to me is like the you know that big arch that's in St. Louis? The St. Louis Arch? I don't think it's called that. <laughs> I don't think so yes. either. <laughs> I think it's called the Gateway to the West. Oh, probably. This is the gateway to the guitar of the 80s and 90s. Oh, okay. Okay. So it's like it's the sultry sound. Like it's the first instance of the sultry sound that we're hearing. It's also the the like the first real evidence of this ripping like super chunky granola guitar. I mean, we have it in Steel Monkey. We do. But this is like, I think it's more evident here because we have the slow build. Yeah. Bum, bum, bum. And then it rips and it and it has all that angst and anger and passion and frustration just flying out of it. It's so good. I think Steel Monkey is on the shreddier side and this is there's Mm. not to say that that shredding is not like really good guitar but there's something more substantial to this kind this is where i start understanding the reason why people designated this as a heavy rock heavy metal album yeah sure sure because it's heavy it's got the guitar as it's working a lot with the overdrive it's being played as an instrument of sound mm-hmm. in some cases rather than a musical instrument. Yeah. It's bridging that divide between like this is music and this is raw sound coming from an angsty man. But it's it's not just the guitar in this song. I mean, no. boy howdy, everybody is there and present. Don't on the drums. This is the first time that we've heard Don Perry on the drums on a Jethro Tull record, chronologically speaking. Yeah. So very good. Because... Steel Monkey was Drumatron 2.0. Right, right. And this is, and obviously we have a number of drummers on this album, but this is the first, this is our first Taste of the Perry. Taste of Doan, yeah. It's very good. Dollop of Doan. Just a dip of Doan. A pinch of Perry. A pinch of Perry. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And I like it. Yeah. I like it a lot. He's good. He's very, very good. We've got Cowbell at three minutes. Guess what? I got a fever. And the only prescription is more cowbell. Of course, that's how I know what time signature it is, because I can follow the cowbell like a kindergartner. And what time signature is it, Nick? Is it 4-4? It sure is. Okay. Yay, you get a gold star. No, I, I'll take a silver on that one. I have, okay. I needed training wheels of the cowbell. <laughs> a good example of Doan's drumming is at about 538, he has that incredible drum fill. 
it shines a light directly into the dark recesses of my brain. It's an overflowing fill. They only needed three cubic feet. He gave them nine, just in case. That's right. That long instrumental breakdown in there, so lovely. I love that. And that's why this song is so long, but it's. I would not want to hear this without it. That yeah. like minute and a half, two minutes, and... You know what? Maybe we did see this in concert, but I can just picture that moment in concert with the smoke coming out and the the lights zipping up and down and them just kind of just heads down, just rocking together. There's something really delightful about this song, and that is the beautiful, tense harmonies that occur between Ian's flute and Martin's guitar on this song. Mm -hmm. And... I think part of the reason this song is so long is because it sets up that breakdown. Yes. The breakdown is long, but the breakdown also is set up in such a way to be successful. So you have these intricate, very haunting harmonies happening early in the, in the first couple of minutes of the song, even in that introduction before the vocals come in, so that you're used to having that tense but harmonious sound. And then when we do get to that breakdown, yeah, it rips that space open and suddenly you're falling into a void of emotion. It's very, very effective. It's very dark. This song has a very dark sound to it. Yeah. In that moment, I can see Ian just running around the stage, visiting everyone as they're doing their parts, just waving his flute phallically like he does, Mm -hmm. while everyone else just rocks out. Another brilliant example of just the artistry and musicality and composition of this song occurs at around 2.35, where they're getting through, it might be the first chorus, or it could be the second chorus. And I left my farm, shoom, all the instruments cut out, and Ian sings, on the freeway. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Looks like my farm is a freeway. There's something, I don't want to say cinematic here, but it's it's definitely theatrical. There is a lot more behind it than let's just play a song. I would say it's cinematic. I, yeah. I have a very cinematic listening experience of this song. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely do get imagery with this song. Yeah. There's some lovely things happening on the synth, which we can assume is programmed by Ian. Mm-hmm. There are some little almost chiming notes Hmm. Just dropped in here and there. Just a little quick ting, ting. And I feel like that helps to give you a little contrast in order to be able to appreciate the depth and darkness of the song. You know, it's like it's like when you have a heavy meat dish and you just have like a pop of a pomegranate seed on there. Mm. Yeah. Do you know what a pomegranate seed is called? A pip. An arrow. An arrow? An arrow. Like Errol Flynn? A-R-R-I-L, I believe. Not like Errol Flynn. Not E-R-O-L? Two R's? Uh, two R's, one Y. Oh, he's a Y. Wow. Uh, he is a Y. <laughs> and he was a monster. Oh, was he? Yeah, yes. That doesn't surprise me. He apparently, he had a specialty built mansion, of course, because he had tons of money. Natch. And he made little peepholes so he could see into the guest bathrooms. Classic Hollywood billionaires. And classy as well. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Anyway. Oh, toward the end of the song, we have some beautiful flute work by Ian Mm -hmm. where he is doing these flute jabs where he's... And and it's a very particular technique where you... So if if you're playing the flute in a standard way... You just create a steady stream of air across the flute. Mm, mm-hmm. He also does a lot of other things, obviously, as we've talked about. But this right. is, is an example that I don't know that we have talked about where if you build up, like, let's say, make a stream of air come out of your mouth and then stop it with your tongue. You feel that pressure in your lungs. Mm-hmm. And then if you just remove your tongue briefly, it goes. We have discussed this. I cannot tell you when. I think it was a long time ago. And he's doing that in succession, so you get that... 
rather than di 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 di. Yeah, it's more percussive. It's more prosecco. It's punctuated. It's a sparkling flute. Right. It's not from the Champagne region. It's not so, from the Champagne region, yeah, but it's, okay. it's a sparkling Champagne style yeah. flute playing. Right. 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 And then we have him toward the very end in that in the denouement of the song, or really the coda of the song, if you will. Mm-hmm. After the final notes of do do do, we have Ian going do. That lowing flute at the end. Bending the note down, which, yeah. which is achieved by twisting the flute away from your mouth, or perhaps toward your mouth, actually. And that's underscored by a single drone note, which might be the bass or might be the synth. But yeah. my goodness, is it haunting. Yeah, that lowing at the end really just, woof! it's so powerful. It's so very powerful. And it really, like they could have ended with a general fade. They could have ended on a, a like a serious button, but mm-hmm. going with that like... Oh, a couple of times, like it's haunting. It feels like a train in the distance. It feels like a lone wolf crying on the mountainside. It feels like your hopes and dreams being undermined like a sandcastle on the shore. It's the last cow that you had to sell off to sell your farm. <sighs> yeah. Anything else musically, Nick, about this song? No, that flute bit was the last thing that I had. There's so... Oh, oh, there's one other thing that I want to point out. It's just such a tasty thing I noted down here. They say they gave me compensation. Whenever they hit, whenever Ian sings the word compensation, the band does this syncopated rhythm behind it. Because mm. Ian's going, now they say they gave me compensation. And under compensation, they go, bum, bum, bum. Oh, cool. Compensation. They say they gave me compensation. As if to underscore the falseness or or hatred of that word. Yeah. Compensation for my life. You are just, you're spending money that in the blink of an eye doesn't make a difference. But for me, it is my entire life. Probably generational. Oh, yeah. We'll get into the whole context of the song here in a minute. But just that pattern of three underscoring this pattern of four is one of those brilliant tall moments that, cr- that and I love about this album where you, you're creating that tension in the structure mm-hmm. of the music itself. Ugh. Yeah, it's in the DNA. It's written into the it's DNA in the of this song. Yeah. Oh, goodness. It's in the mitochondria. Well, the metachlorians even. <laughs> <laughs> the tall is strong with this one. <laughs> <laughs> Here we are. We hopped in the back of a lorry, and we are riding down the freeway here. I've got my possessions in a handkerchief. I sold all of my possessions, including my farm. And we're going to address the elephant early, the elephant in this trailer, and the elephant in the room. We're going to talk the Grammys. Yes, this is perhaps the most pop culture famous occurrence that marks the career of Jethro Tull. Yeah, Nick. Let's let's talk about the let's talk about the Grammys and the Hard Rock, and the Heavy Metal uh, Award. Sure. So, we all know they won the Best Hard Rock slash Heavy Metal Grammy against Metallica, Jane's Addiction, a couple of other people. Something some people don't know is this was the first mm-hmm. time they ever had this category. Yes, and I think that part of the confusion about to whom they should award it came from a confusion on the part of the judges or the committee about what the heck is hard rock or heavy metal. Yeah, what is that? What fits into that category? They were trying to define it, and... They got it wrong. And they got it wrong. (laughs) (laughs) Omen, you have uh, have a quote from one of your tall biology... Not biology. One of your tall biography books here. This is from A Passion Play, the story of Ian Anderson and Jethro Tull by Brian Rabby. And on the subject of... The Grammy win, Rabbi writes, Anderson is magnanimous in victory. Quote, I'm very pleased to have won, because it is something of an accolade, coming from one's peer group of a large number of people who have been creatively involved in the music business for a number of years. It's a recognition from them, and to them I say a warm thank you. Now, this was 
the quote from, I believe, years on, looking back with yeah. the wisdom of, of time. Right. I've got a bunch of quotes from the collected tall magazines that I've had over the, the years here. So I'm going to start with Ian here. Unstick those pages and read them out. Oh, goodness. From Ian, perhaps because we were five nice men who had never won a Grammy before, the voting members of the National Academy of Recording Arts and Sciences decided we should receive a nomination. It's a peer group award from people in the industry. Producers, musicians, record company professionals who give the reward. It's not the six on the X Factor. The hot ticket was Metallica in this newly introduced category of hard rock metal. I was told by our record company, by the then head of Chrysalis in the USA, not to bother going, which is a euphemism for, we're not going to pay your airfare or get you a hotel because we don't think you're going to win. Hmm. Tongue in cheek, our record company placed an ad in Billboard magazine with the line, the flute is a heavy, comma, metal instrument. Oh, a very, very humorous comma. I love it. When the Grammy trophies finally arrived, one of them, I think it was Martin Barr's, had actually broken in transit. Oh no! (laughs) And a quote from Lars Ulrich, the drummer from Metallica. Some three weeks before the awards, all those who are in touch, quote unquote, the critics, the day-to-day involved people, assumed that Metallica would walk away with the award. It's easy for the in-touch people to think that, but remember that most of the Academy who vote for the nominees are in the age group of 40 to 60 and are very much less in tune with what goes on in the music scene. Mm -hmm. And then finally, from Alice Cooper, who was one of the presenters, he says, We went to the Shrine Auditorium for rehearsals that day, and that involved opening an envelope with a dummy card inside, which has a name on it. But it's never the name of the real winner, it just gives you something to read out. I think during rehearsal, the name on that card was Jethro Tull, so I read it out. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> Can you imagine? So he must have thought he, he got the, the wrong card. The dummy card again? Yeah, at, at the actual presentation, that's very funny. Yeah, and then during the, the ceremony, he says, I opened the envelope, and when I saw the name, I thought they'd given me the envelope from the rehearsal. Yeah, wow. spot on. I looked at it again, and it did have a different seal on it and details like that. It was the real thing. So I said, for the best hard rock slash heavy metal Grammy, Jethro Tull. There was a two-minute pause, then everybody <laughs> broke out laughing. They thought I was doing a joke. I said, no, I'm not kidding, Jethro Tull. There was this huge sort of springtime for Hitler gasp from the audience because the (laughs) contenders were really well-known metal acts. What a good uh, cultural reference by Alice Cooper, no less. Yeah, referencing the producers. The producers, yeah. Yeah. Original was Zero Mostel and... Gene Wilder. Gene Wilder, yeah, yeah, yeah. Then he says, Jethro Tull were not there, so I just accepted the award for them. I said to the guys in Metallica, you know, if you got a little heavier, you could be up there with Jethro Tull. Wow. Yeah. Now, my recollection is that at the time, Ian said something to the effect of, look what you've done. Metallica are all weeping into their spandex handkerchiefs. Something like that, yeah. It was slightly catty, yeah. You know, I, I get the sense that, that occasionally Ian's personality is such that, that when he speaks off the cuff, it can come off as quite brusque. Yeah. And then with years of reflection, he amends his <laughs> yes. his tone a little bit, but... You know, that's that's just part of his personality. Yeah. And you can actually see this moment on YouTube and it's it's pretty good. He's the thing is Alice is up there and he's with the other presenter. I don't remember who she is. When he goes to pull out the envelope, he pulls out a rubber snake as a joke because he always has like boa constrictors draped on him and and shit. Oh, okay, sure. While he's opening the envelope, the woman is like, she's playing with the snake, so she's like pulling the focus. So there's, you see this moment of Alice Cooper not believing it. You can see it happen. Everybody else is distracted. By the snake. By her like hamming it up. And, but if you know to look at Alice, like it's, it's a real moment there. It's really good. It's a really like historical moment. Absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. Anything else to add about the Grammy win by Jethro Tull over the other nice metal men? (laughs) No, I'll find that video clip and drop it in the show notes if you want to take a look at that. Delightful. Well, we just took a a left turn at Albuquerque, so we'd better better jump off of this moving truck into the bushes. Yeah, I'm going to shoot for the scrub grass over there. And um, did you know 
that tumbleweeds are actually an invasive species? I didn't. There you go. <laughs> okay, I am dusted off, a little bruised, but we made it. We made it here. I don't know where we are, actually. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> we are in the analysis section of this song, Nick. That's where it is. I didn't see a sign, but, you know, it looks familiar. Yeah. You can tell by the position of the sun. And the smell. Yeah. So... <laughs> So here we are in the 1980s with this song, and, and mm -hmm. Ian has said, we, we read out earlier that this song was inspired by countless trips across the U.S. in a tour bus or, or by, by land vehicle, by terrestrial vehicle. Yeah. A lot of the imagery in this song, I think that you and I have both experienced driving, even in upstate New York. Good shelter down there on the valley floor, down by where the sweet stream runs. Good shelter down there. Down by where the sweet stream runs. So, I mean, if you think about the Hudson Valley mm -hmm. or the Mohawk Valley, you know, you're, you have these big sheltering hills on both sides. And then there's this valley that runs through the state. And it's very, very fertile because of all the nutrients that have been built up there over the, the millennia by the river. That's excellent, excellent farmland. Yeah. Even the Finger Lakes region is Sure. Great for hops and wine grapes, things like that. And you, you can find yourself at the top of these, the kind of the runs of hill between mm -hmm. each of the Finger Lakes. This could describe so many different places in the United States. Mm -hmm. And it appears to be a song about a farmer being forcibly removed from their land by a company or by the U.S. government who wants to build a, a highway. Yeah, forcibly paid for their land. I think there's a term for that. The only thing I can think of is eminent domain, but that's not the case. Oh, maybe it is. What is eminent domain? Eminent domain is when the government's like, oh, we need this for government stuff. Oh, that sounds like it. Yes. Eminent domain refers to, not imminent, eminent. Sometimes it's imminent. It's, uh, sometimes it is. Refers to the process by which the government may seize private property for proper compensation, but without the owner's consent. Wow exactly what this is eminent domain wow yeah yeah so we're building a road here we'll pay you probably super low ball you but you got to get out because there's going to be asphalt here in a month well and even if even if the government pays quite a huge sum of money mm -hmm. you mentioned this you know a couple minutes ago but a lot of farms that a lot of farmland in general in the world is generational yeah so you know, if you think about the the Dust Bowl mm -hmm. of the 1930s, you know, those were lands that could have been cultivated by the same family for, you know, a couple hundred years, at least, yeah. at, least two, at least two or three generations. Yeah, exactly. Here, it could be even longer. Now, while we were experiencing a lot of expansion of roads in the 1980s, there were some other factors in the landscape of agricultural America that I was not aware of until we started listening to this song and, and really started doing a little research. Yeah, there's quite a history. There's quite an agricultural history to our country. It's really fairly fascinating. So during the 1970s, there was a big press on U.S. farmers to produce, 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 produce. The slogan was, go big or get out. Yeah. And the technology existed to go big. So single farmers were able to buy up more land and cultivate more land at a go. We started seeing more monocropping. Yes, monocultures, yeah. Advances in fertilizer, tractor technology, etc. allowed higher yields for the same amount of acreage. And simultaneously, there were some weather conditions that happened across the world, which diminished the harvests of, of big grain producing countries um, across the world. The Soviet Union also negotiated a contract with the U.S. where the U.S. agreed to send huge quantities of grain. And so there was this massive, massive demand for grain. The value of land went up and people were buying it like crazy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When the 1980s happened, that stopped. All, a lot of those factors switched. And suddenly, U.S. grain and agricultural products were not worth what they used to be. And so there was this massive and fairly invisible to people who weren't in the agricultural community 
sell-off of land. The value of land plummeted. Profit margins, which, you know, in agriculture are already quite slim, went down to a knife edge. All those loans that they took out in pure confidence, mm-hmm. they all of a sudden couldn't pay. Jimmy Carter stopped selling to Russia, stopped selling the grain to Russia, which cut off that source of money too. Right. So there were all these factors that conspired to make it a really, really tough time. Like you said, the, the bank loans became, they kind of became due at that time. There's yeah. often a grace period with that kind of stuff. And all of these farmers had to abandon their farms. There was nothing else to do. Uh, Their suicide rates shot up. I mean, it was a really bad time. And unlike the Great Depression that we referenced earlier, it was somewhat invisible to urban Americans. Yeah, yeah. If you're not involved in that world, then you just go about your business. You don't see any changes anywhere. Yeah. And it took a long time for... Washington to realize what was happening and and there did eventually there was some legislation written later on that attempted to help out farmers but the 1980s right the period when Ian was writing this song and traveling across the US was a very very dark time for yeah. agricultural Americans so even though this is a story in this song about eminent domain and a and a farm being bulldozed to make way for a four lane or six lane highway the context in which that exists is this really tense, dark time. It's bittersweet is what it is. You know, it's bittersweet chocolate. It's I can't afford this farm anymore. This farm that has been in my family for generations. They're paying me, which is great. I have an out, but I mean, what am I going to do with a million dollars and my pickup truck? And that's the thing. If you are a generational farmer, it's not just a matter of money. It's a matter of lifestyle and, and what you know. What else are you going to do? It's like the coal farmers in Virginia. The coal farmers? <laughs> Those, the coal ain't coming up like it oh, used to. Oh, man. That, that wild coal. Got to go out and collect it. <laughs> yes. No, it is. It's easy for us East Coast intellectual elites to say, oh, well, we'll just train all the coal miners to service wind farms. Yeah. But it ain't like that if you go down into the holler. Yeah. So... Let's break down some of the specific lyrics in this song, Nick. Yeah, we touched a little bit on the the first one. Nine miles of two-strand topped with barbed wire laid by the father for the son. Nine miles of two-strand topped with barbed wire Laid by the father for the son Again, we've we've got imagery, we've got the generational thing. Good shelter down there on the valley floor, down by where the sweet stream run. Good shelter down there on the valley floor, down by where the sweet stream run. It is idyllic. It is perfect. My dad built this for me. I'm working it for my son. He will take it over. What's that song? Daddy, won't you take me back to Muhlenberg County where... I have no idea. And Daddy, won't you take me back to Muhlenberg County down by the Green River where paradise lay. Mr. Peabody's coal train has sold it away. Look up Mr. Peabody's coal train. It is paradise. Oh, it's John Prine. Wow. John Prine is a uh, folk legend. So, and, and this is a similar story in in some ways daddy won't you take me back to muhlenberg county down by the green river where paradise lay where i'm well sorry my son but you're too late in asking mr peabody's coal train has hauled it away so this conflict between a traditional way of life and idyllic way of life i mean the way that ian describes shelter by the valley floor with a sweet stream oh my god and then contrasting that with and the big roads pushing through along the valley floor hot machine pouring six lanes at the very least and the big roads pushing through along the valley floor hot machine pouring six lanes at the very least even the consonants that he uses to contrast mm. some of these concepts it's sharp it reminds you it it calls to mind images of the scouring of the shire in mm. in tolkien or the yeah. you know saruman bulldozing the forest to make way for his armies of half men half orcs urukai yeah good nerdy reference there thank you now they might give me compensation but that's not what i'm chasing i was a rich man before yesterday now they might give me compensation that's not what i'm chasing i want 
Again, it, it's what you've inherited. It's what you know. The richness of a lifestyle and and a depth of experience, rather than, you know, the '80s was what do they call it, the me generation, hmm. where things took a, a real turn toward consumerism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had Reaganomics, we had Thatchernomics, and the idea was money is the most valuable thing. And this speaker in this song, the farmer in this song, is saying money is worthless to me. A million dollars is worthless. Yeah, I mean you can go buy a house and try and buy another farm, but it's it'll never be the same. And this encroachment that is being described, they're busy building airports on the south side, silicon chip factory on the east. They're busy building airports on the south side, silicon chip factory on the east. It's closing in around you. Yeah, right. Eventually, all of that land will be gone. It'll be used for something else. Well, and, you, and if you look at time-lapse maps of areas of the U.S., you see urban sprawl mm -hmm. and cities being built in this way that really does look like kind of a cancer growing on the face of the earth. Right. You know, I feel every generation always complains about the changes that are happening, but this is something that it's not... Oh, the, you know, the neighbors are getting closer. It's this way of life has ceased to exist. You can fight it tooth and nail, but eventually, even if you're the last holdout, nothing else is going to be working this way. So you're basically an antique. You know, there's, there's only so much that you can do to fight. They forgot they told us what this old land was for. They forgot they told us what this old land was for. That's a fascinating line. Hmm. For me, it causes a connection in my brain between the U.S. government in the early 1800s who were saying to people on the East Coast, look, if you go out to Montana, if you go out to Idaho, we will give you this land. All you have to do, we'll give you, we'll fund you to get out there. All you have to do is go out there and cultivate it and start a family. I think it can be more recent. I think it's the equivalent of go big or get out. It's that. They said, everybody, grow, 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 grow. Grow right. everything you can. We'll pay you to do it. Grow two tons the acre, boy, between the stones. Yeah. Grow two tons the acre, boy, between the stones. And it's fascinating. He says, this was no South Fork. It was no Ponderosa. This was no South Fork. It was no Ponderosa. So that could refer to South Fork, Colorado. Yeah. Ponderosa, California. Gorgeous, beautiful, picturesque places. There's also a South Fork and a Ponderosa in Georgia and Kentucky, oddly enough. There's a Ponderosa Steakhouse in the strip mall down the street from here. Yep. They could be referencing that. Could yeah. be. Yeah. But it was the place that I called home. But it was the place that I called home. He's not chasing compensation. He was already a rich man. And what do I want with a million dollars in a pickup truck when I left my farm under the freeway? Under the freeway. Yeah. Yeah, it goes from, let's see, it goes from, I left my farm on the freeway, looks like my farm is a freeway, to when I left my farm under the freeway. That's like that other song. They paved paradise and put up oh, a parking lot. I hate that song. I'm not even putting a clip in for that one. Paved that paradise, song. put in a parking lot. Ooh, la, 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 la. Yeah. That's it. That's the most you're going to get. Terrible song. Awful song. I've heard so many covers of that song. Yes. But yes. But same, same thing. Exact same thing. Yeah, you're right. So what do we do about any of this, Nick? Like, what's... <laughs> I feel sad and depressed now. Like, is there a call to action? Is that what you're looking for? I guess, right. One question is, what does Ian want us to do with this song? Mm. Or is there nothing? Is it just strictly observational? I think it's really just an awareness, you know? I mean, and, and he said, I think in one of the early quotes that you read when he referenced this being inspired by uh, his trips through the States, that eventually it did happen in the UK as well. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I mean, already in the album, we get this kind of, again, the thing that I love about Ian is that he just sets these things out for us and doesn't push his own opinion onto the material. Yeah. The first track is glorifying the person who is building this modern world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the second track is the person who's being crushed by the building of this modern world. Very good point. 
Uh, and, but they're both working man songs mm-hmm. that different types of people can relate to and c- can connect with. Like you said, this one doesn't give a specific like, oh, this is the plight and this is bad. But you do you do get the sense of like, well, what the hell from the narrator. But it's not Ian telling us what the hell. It's the point of view of this farmer. Yeah. I mean, he could just as easily have written a song about, not that he ever would, but a government fat cat moving in and saying, hey, we're going to buy your, we're going to buy your farm. Get out of here. Here's a check. Absolutely. Yeah. Or it, he could have written a song from the perspective of the farmer that was along the lines of, who boy, I got a half oh, a million dollar sure. check. Oh, oh. Yeah. Going to take Susie out for a couple beans. Someone excited about something new, about a new venture, about new opportunity. But Ian, being a traditionalist in some ways, having a deep connection to the land, having experienced what it means to be an agriculturalist with his salmon farm, Mm -hmm. had a different perspective. Yeah. Yeah, I like it. For a fun dive into history, if you look up the history of barbed wire, it is a fascinating, frightening, tinged with racism, and imperialist jaunt sounds like everything i would expect (laughs) we can't have anything in this country (laughs) no no we can't literally anything you enjoy you're wrong for doing so (laughs) go pay your penance yeah go pin your pants (laughs) go pin your pants they've fallen down Omen, so we are on track three next week. Do you know what track three off of Crest is? I am so freaking excited about this track because we have referenced it about one million times already on this podcast. It is Jumpstart. Oh my goodness. I want someone to write in and tell me if Jumpstart was your Jumpstart. We need to find that that. That pearl among the clams, please. A clam pearl. Until next week when we will start your jump, I am the compensation that nobody asked for, Omen Thomas said. Watch my sweet stream run. I'm Nick McGill. We are a hot machine pouring six lanes into your ears, the feckless moms. And this is the two tons the acre boy, talk tall to me. Uh, Jimmy, give me another, uh, give me another shiner light and uh, and a shot of whiskey to chase it down with. I I gotta I gotta drown my farm in blues. Oh, Cletus. Well, hey there, Billy Bob. Why, why the long face? Cletus, you'll you'll never believe what happened to me today. Oh no! Did the rust rot get into your soybeans again? No, I got that under control. Oh, did the silk mites? destroy your corn crop like back in 71? No, no, you know I haven't grown corn since 71 just because of that. Oh, that's right, that's right, that's right. Well, what is it, old boy? Oh, Cletus, the man come knocking round my door, said they want to put a, they want to put a road, they want to put a six-lane highway where my farm is. Oh, Billy Bob, sweet Jesus, Mary and Joseph are smiling down on you. You got that sweet, sweet government money. How much they give you for it? They claim an imminent domain, but they gave me a check for about a million dollars. A bit! A bit! Billy Bob! Billy Bob, you got a check for a million dollars. And you got rid of your potato rotten farm? You're the luckiest man in Bent Tusk, Iowa! <laughs> Cletus, you know all I've been doing my whole life is farming. I got it in my blood, I got it under my nails, my bones is made of manure, you know that. But Billy Bob! Now, you could do whatever you want. You could go down to Las Vegas and become an Elvis impersonator. You could marry unworthy couples in a chapel 
off of Route 66 and charge him $30 a pop. You can buy six different Elvis suits in every color of the rainbow. Cletus, I, I just want a farm. Why are you such a stupid, dumb son of a bitch? <laughs> you want to dig in the dirt? I've got, I've got to get up at 4 a.m. to go milk a bunch of cows who kick me in the face. You're doing it wrong. That's right, because there's no right way to do it. You have only bulls on your farm, Cletus. We know that. I know that. <laughs> Listen, my grandpa taught me one way and I ain't changing that. <laughs> and that's just it. You don't want to change, Cletus. I don't want to change. Billy Bob, Billy Bob, with one million U.S. greenback dollars, you could move to the islands of Hawaii and rent 30 or 35 what they call them fancy ski doos that go on the water like. You could rent them out to tourists what come down for their honeymoon and you could become a million million dollar heir. You could eat pineapple for your breakfast and work about a half hour a day and spend the rest of the day working on your tan. You know my tan stops at the shirt line. I refuse to get more of a tan than that, Cletus. Cletus, I, I have an idea. Billy Bob, tell me, what is it? Cletus. Billy Bob. Would you sell me your farm for a million dollars? A million dollars. Oh, a million dollars for my sh piece of farm that ain't worth two bits. My farm where there ain't even no soil on it, but everything is just made of rock and charcoal. <laughs> my farm where my mama took one look out the window, snuffed a bucket full of paint and died. My farm where I had six chillins, and they all died of hard work before the time that they was three years old. Is that worth a million dollars to you, Billy Bob? Well, I reckon it is, Cletus, for that good, simple life of milking bulls and harvesting charcoal. Billy Bob, I never thought I would say these words in my life, but all the apostles and the Moses and all the begats and the fiery... The fiery Satan butthole himself is looking down on me all with a choir angel singing and I must shout to you after I kiss you upon the mouth. Talk to Ultimate is a proud member of the Feckless Mom's Audio Network. Hawaii, here I come!